being a reverend of our local congregation was a family tradition. My father was a reverend, his father was a reverend, his father was one. You get the picture. Sure, I might have had some doubts about the profession, and in life I had tried to stave it off by furthering my education at some faraway university. But one way or another, the position called for me. I devoted most of my time at the university studying theology and religion. I was at the top of my class. Soon came when my father passed the task of reverend to me. I recall that before he died, he seemed to be slightly darker in his mannerisms. He was always an optimistic man, even in the face of anyone who criticized his livelihood. But in his final years, he changed immensely. Anywhere he went, he carried grimness with him. He acted as though a rain cloud were over his head. He had grown despondent at his time of death, refusing to accept any prayers that his immortal soul be taken to a place of rest. But just before he succumbed and left the mortal realm, there were reports that he was deeply horrified and hyperventilated rapidly. His heart rate skyrocketed to abnormal leaps, and he died. A look of sheer horror being permanently glued on his face. My first year as a reverend didn't go as well as you'd imagine. For one, there were many young people who were the epitome of smart Alex. They always loved to bring up the supposed contradictions in the scriptures, or how God was an immortal being who by all accounts was a tyrannical mass murderer who was offended that mankind worshipped other gods, or that he was simply unfair. This was always something that I was raised to believe. God had his reasons for what he does. What may seem to be bad in our eyes is merely because we view things from our own perspective rather than his. Sure, descriptions of God firing down burning sulfur and brimstone onto Sodom and Gomorrah were terrible, or God's slaughtering of the Egyptian children in the tenth and final plague that befell Egypt sounded horrific, but at the end of the day, I was convinced that God ultimately saw it as being for the Israelites good. And whenever bad things happened in my life, I held on to my faith. Just last month, I lost my youngest son Theodore to childhood leukemia. Yes, we prayed fervently for his recovery until he took his last breath. But still, maybe God wanted his precious, precious soul to be with him immediately. My one regret, however, was that he never was baptized. I remember my daughter looking at me with the most frightful expression of concern, that her brother was in hell because he was too young to understand the notion of turning his life over to Christ. I tried to console my daughter that he was in heaven, but she only compounded my frustrations by asking why man was considered wicked the moment he was born then. But with all my trials, I prevailed. I continued to preach God's word to the masses, saving countless souls. Some didn't accept the word, but if the seeds were sown, I was content. For sixty years I taught the same lesson of God's love for us and how he sent his son to act on our behalf. I also challenged countless atheist and agnostic debaters. To my congregation, I had, in their words, royally schooled them on my knowledge of the scriptures. By the time I retired, my eldest son Samuel took up the mantle. He started out kind of like how I did. He wasn't as bold in what he was saying, but within three months he was becoming more convinced by the word. At the age of 64, everything changed. During a monthly checkup with my doctor, I received the news that a tumor was detected forming in my frontal lobe. Earlier I had endured severe headaches and I felt more tired than usual. I went to chemotherapy for weeks. Anything that the doctors tried to implement simply did not work. 
On my deathbed, my family gathered around. My church congregation had since ceased their prayers for me. Dying never really bothered me. Since I didn't remember what it was like to be born, this would then mean that dying would be painless. My vital signs started to fade, and after two minutes, I let myself slip away. A beam of light gently grazed upon my eyes, forcing them open. My eyes beheld the pearly gates. Past that was the streets paved with gold and the many mansions that Christ discussed with his followers. As my eyes beheld several of the sights, I noticed that there was something strangely odd about it all. No one was present. I expected to, at the very least, see old faces once I woke up in heaven. Instead, the streets were empty. Rather than hearing angelic singing, I found everything bereft of the slightest murmur. I walked around the barren streets for quite some time. Right when I turned to head back, a low, audible sound crept into my ears. My legs tightened. Without a second thought, I sprinted towards the sight of the audible noises. It took me to the very heart of the city. Right when I was about to make a right turn, my eyes locked onto something. In the middle of the square was the throne of God. The exact white throne that was attributed to God, and the exact one where it was held that he would judge the living and the dead. It was awe-inspiring. It was everything that I was taught to believe. The throne glowed with pure white light. But with all that breathtaking majesty aside, something felt horribly wrong about it. The throne flickered feverishly. The sounds became more audible. Curiosity crept into me, and I slowly walked towards the throne. What I saw made me question everything. The throne itself throbbed as if it were a nightcrawler thrashing on a fishing hook. Upon closer inspection, I saw the faintest of human attributes on the throne. The throne of God pulsated rapidly, the screaming nearly deafening me. Before my eyes, faces emerged from the throne. Each one bore the same look of terror. Their eyes were wide, almost as if they were observing something, but at a long distance. I could feel the heat of their glares on me, as though they were trying to telepathically beg me to put them out of their misery. They screamed in unison their shrieks sounding like legions of malfunctioning sirens. I looked further at the throne, seeing that it had a fleshy appearance. It was as though the throne itself was one living creature. The tortured beings frothed at the mouth, making inhuman noises. The sounds of absolute hell. I could make out an innumerable number of bodies that comprised the great white throne of judgment. Limbs littered the throne in different places. The light began to fade, revealing the throne to be nothing more than a putrid-smelling mass of red meat. Whoever these people were, they had been conjoined. Something must have broken them down and put them back together with gallons of glue. I felt myself nearly vomiting if it were not for... a voice... Welcome to heaven. I looked up at the throne of God and saw a gargantuan figure sitting in the chair, as though it were completely unaware of the horrid screaming coming from its throne. The voice wasn't as loud as I'd imagined it to be. It sounded as soft as the wind, but it didn't comfort me in the slightest. This being was submerged in blinding light. I searched for a resemblance of a face on this large entity, but I just couldn't. The further I looked on this creature, I felt terror bubble from the deepest parts of my stomach. Somehow, I managed to choke out a few words. Are you God? While I couldn't see it, I could tell that the being before me had a wide smile across its face. 
I have many names, it stated, in the same eerie giddiness. I am Yahweh, Jehovah. What he said next shocked me the most. I am also Zeus, Thor, I am Shiva, all of the gods that humanity had willingly believed in. I stood there, my jaw agape. But, but God, what about my life's work? God chuckled. <laughs> you humans never cease to amaze me with the utter ridiculousness of what you'd be willing to believe. God had a good chuckle over it, as if I had told him one of the funniest jokes in over a thousand years, the joke being my former life. After laughing fervently, God paused to feel the texture of the throne. It is a fine throne, isn't it? God asked. My hopes of God somehow being ignorant of the deathly screeches of its throne died at that moment. This God almost got ecstasy from hearing millions, maybe trillions of souls being melded together as a large blob of disharmony. The urge to vomit arose again. Do you know what this throne is made of? God asked. I shook my head, not wanting to know. But God was of course going to disclose the texture of it, regardless of whether it intrigued me or not. Years ago, I created the angels. God shuffled in its chair before continuing. They were always meant to worship me, but after eons of feeding off their praise, it wasn't enough for me. I flinched as I expected more vivid descriptions from God. When I created man in my own image, the angels didn't want them to suffer as they had. God sounded noticeably angered, its voice raising an octave to emphasize it. So one leader rose up to rebel against me. Satan, I said. God scoffed. Because of their betrayal, I decided the best way to punish them is to condemn them to a life of endless suffering, one which would make them regret being birthed from the fires. I nearly fell backward at the realization. God's throne was comprised of the fused bodies of nearly a third of the angels who rebelled against him and failed. Now they were being made to be eternally tortured. I tried to rationalize God's justifications for this disproportionate retribution, but no logical answer would suffice. There were no excuses for what God had done. But the one thing that made me more curious was what became of the human souls of those who had died. If what God had said was true, then the afterlife as we know it is just one inescapable nightmare. God apparently read my thoughts, and before my eyes, he conjured up legions of souls. Each soul lacked pupils in their eyes, and their skins were a pale gray. They reminded me of the many zombie-related movies in olden times, but they were all people I knew in life. The one that caught my eyes the most was a small figure. It tilted back and forth, its mouth open, as though it were inciting a chant. I would recognize that short stature anywhere. It was Theodore. I ran to my son and hugged him tightly. I opened my eyes, fully expecting the hug to be reciprocated, but instead, I felt the slight nibble on my neck. I looked at my son, and to my horror, he started to bite down into my neck in a blind frenzy. I pried him off, tossing him to the ground, only for him to emotionlessly pick himself up and stand with the other souls. I turned to look at God in anger. That's not my son. God giggled. He merely looked at the souls before him, as though he were an artist marveling at their work. No, he isn't. And he never was. Each human soul was a former shell of themselves, 
lacking even the slightest characteristic that made them lively. They had instead become inhuman slaves without their free will. At the time of death, God stripped each soul of their individuality, making them worship him forevermore. This would be the fate of the untold numbers of people who either followed the Christian faith or any religion for that matter. It seemed to not even matter if you chose to not pursue a religion, because I saw many of my former atheist and agnostic debaters in the masses as well. It all made sense why God would masquerade as different gods. The more people he got to believe in him, the more he would bathe in their worship until their time of death, when they would be made into the perfect followers by being removed from anything that made them human. This was the fate of my son, my father, and my grandfather. Even if I chose against the profession of a reverend, it wouldn't have mattered much to God, because he'd convert me the moment I stepped foot in his kingdom. I felt myself getting lifted into the air against my will. I levitated over the masses of souls, and I was back to God and his revolting throne. While again I couldn't see a discernible expression on his face, something told me that it was smirking. Well, time for you to join the heavenly choir, shall we? Not expecting an answer, I felt a surge of God's power penetrate my body and consume me. I screamed in excruciating pain as my world suddenly started to grow dark. I tried to fight against the conversion with all my might, but my rationality was starting to melt away. I couldn't speak. I couldn't think a cognitive thought. I used the last of my consciousness to curse God's name before sudden darkness filled my sights.